Bienvenido, buenas tardes. A esta conferencia caribeña, auspiciada por el Instituto de Estudios del Caribe. Mi nombre es Juan Justi Cordero, coordinador del Archivo de Ciencias Sociales y del Caribe, que es una unidad del Instituto de Estudios del Caribe. Estamos hoy en la conferencia número 273 de la temporada 22 de la conferencia caribeña. Es la serie de conferencias de más larga duración en este recinto de Río Piedra. Y tenemos hoy el placer de eh, recibir al doctor Nicolás Broco y al doctor Jess Zimmerman del Departamento de Ciencias Ambientales de la Facultad de Ciencias Naturales. Eh, agradecemos particularmente la colaboración de la Oficina del Rector del Recinto de Río Piedras y la Oficina de la Decana de la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales. La conferencia de hoy se titula Stronger Hurricanes, Longer Droughts and Puerto Rico's Environmental Future. El doctor Nicolás Broco comenzó la investigación de bosques tropicales en 1974 y comenzó a trabajar en Puerto Rico en el 1989, llegando a Puerto Rico en el 2001. La mayoría de su trabajo actualmente es en Belice, en Centroamérica. Broco se enfoca en las variaciones de estructura de los bosques y en las especies de los árboles y su composición a través del tiempo y en diferentes paisajes. Es profesor del Departamento de, Cienci de Ciencias Ambientales y director del de Departamento de Ciencias Ambientales de Recinto de Río Piedra. Tiene un Ph.D. de la Universidad de Chicago. Jess Zimmerman nació en Iowa y eh, se trasladó a Puerto Rico en 1991. Recibió su entrenamiento en la Universidad McGill, en la Universidad de Windsor y la Universidad de Utah. Eh, Zimmerman se entrenó como ecólogo evolucionario o evolutivo, evolutionary ecologist. Eh, pero se ha enfocado en las dinámicas de los bosques tropicales y en su gerencia desde que llegó a Puerto Rico. Y está adscrito no al Departamento de Ciencias Ambientales, ¿no? Es a, o sí, sí también. Y a la, pero eh, su trabajo es, se realiza mucho en, en el proyecto en Luquillo, ¿verdad? Él es Lead Principal Investigator, principal investigador eh, directivo del proyecto Long Term Ecological Research Program, LTER, en Luquillo, Luquillo Long Term Ecological Research Program, eh, el cual se dedica a la comprensión de cómo un clima cambiante afectaría al yunque y a áreas circundantes del noreste de Puerto Rico. Es también director de la estación El Verde en Río Grande. Así que con ustedes dejo al profesor Rocco. El doctor Rocco comenzará eh, la Dará la primera ponencia, luego el doctor Zimmerman, y yo haré unos comentarios y tendremos preguntas. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Juan. So, if I heard right, this is the 173rd. 273. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to be the 273rd, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, we all think about Puerto Rico a lot because we live here and there are so many issues, but I was been thinking recently that despite all that, uh, we do live in a paradise. It's a, uh, a paradise for, for people like us because there is so much going on for the ecologist, the sociologist, the economist, the historian, all sorts of interlinking patterns and trends that we can investigate and they're really interesting and exciting to look at. I'll give you a, an example of this. This is a fairly well-known graph showing some of these interlocking uh, patterns that I'm talking about. Up here, for example, you have the population of Puerto Rico first measured in 1800 and increasing up into the uh, 2000 or so. But, and then down here on this part of the graph, you've got on this axis land cover percentage, and then you've got that same timeline. And what you see is the forest decreasing until about 1950, then coming back as uh, urbanization and industrialization started on the island, and then leveling off a little, little while later. 
On the other, the other side of the coin is, of course, as the forest went down, pasture went up, and pasture goes down. As the forest goes up, crops go up and down likewise. And then we see this movement here into the urban areas from the rural areas. So what you've got are all these interlocking patterns of different types, ecological, social, and economic, uh, that are happening at the same time and creating a, a really rich field for investigation. I would guess that uh, there's potentially a, a thousand PhD dissertations embedded in all the interactions, mechanisms, causes, and consequences that you see in this, in this diagram. And the story has not ended. There are new things happening uh, that will make, keep Puerto Rico this dynamic place with all these interacting, interacting trends. And this is uh, one of the ones, uh, one of the things that's, that's still happening and may intensify. This is the forest at El Yunque after Hurricane Maria. And we are told by climate modelers that storms like Hurricane Maria may be more intense in the future, which will, as in the previous diagram, have uh, economic effects, social effects, and certainly ecological effects. Another trend that we're expecting is an increasing drought. So in this talk today, I'm going to talk about the impact of hurricanes on the forest and the consequences for the forest of the future, how that will change the forest and what that means for us. And then Jess, in the second part of this symposium, we'll talk about drought. Our work uh, largely takes place in the Luquillo Mountains here. And the particular work that I'm going to talk about takes place at El Verde Field Station. And this has been the site of the Luquillo Long-Term Ecological Research Program, a multidisciplinary, multi-investigator uh, research program that began in 1989 and continues, and Jess will tell you tell you more about it. Uh, this is that was the the study area El Verde, and this is the study site that I'm going to talk about, or at least a part of it, to give you an idea of uh, what it looks like. This is the Luquillo Forest Dynamics plot. It's 16 hectares in area. And on it, you see this, this is sort of exaggerated topographic map. Uh, it's 500 meters in one direction, uh, 400, uh, no, 320 in another direction, and then it has an elevation gradient. And it is gridded. In other words, there's a stake at each one of these cross pieces in this, in this thing that looks like rumpled graph paper. The study I'm doing is in part of, part of this plot and it has an even finer system of points, like as in this grid system. And my question has been, what are the impacts of hurricanes on the forest? And then going beyond that, how does the forest recover or respond from, the, from those impacts? So we set up this study in 1989 before Hurricane Hugo. It was a one hectare plot, a five by five meter grid system. And above each one of those points, we measured the top canopy height. And we also determined the presence or absence of vegetation in a series of height intervals from zero uh, up to about 30 meters. And here are the results of the first two censuses, which give you an idea of what an impact a hurricane has on the forest. So, on this axis, you've got percent cover, meaning the, the presence or absence of vegetation of any type in height intervals above ground. So you see here 0.5 to 1 meter to 1.5 to 2, and then in a graduated series of intervals up to 30 meters. Before Hurricane Hugo, which you, you see the, the relative amount of vegetation cover at the different heights in the dark bars. And what you see here is a mature, fairly mature forest with an upper canopy that's more or less continuous. 
There are a few things sticking high up, emergent trees, and down, down below where it's shady, there's less foliage because photosynthesis is reduced. And then there's a kind of a, a ground layer of very shade tolerant plants right at the bottom. A fairly normal, undisturbed forest. Hugo changed all that, as you can see. This is after the hurricane. It was much reduced. It was more or less like that picture I showed in the second slide, or the third slide, showing the impact of Maria. Really opened it up. And so that, that's the, the immediate impact. But what happens after that? How does the forest recover? How does it get back to this stage, which it has many times? Hugo is not the first hurricane, I'm sure, to do this to the forest. Well, here's how, here's how it comes back. There are three main modes of recovery. The first is that the trees, which have been changed into just a bunch of poles sticking up and debranched, have lost their branches and lost their leaves, start to sprout along the trunks. Here's one that's just right, leaves are right along the trunk. Here's one that has sprouted at the top and created a kind of a lollipop. After Hugo, we watched this process, and pretty soon it filled out the canopy again. Another way that recovery occurs is by the accelerated growth of saplings, which already were in the understory, just sitting there, waiting for sunlight to come in, and then their growth increases if they didn't get smashed by something falling down. So here's an Asubo sapling, uh, and uh, I was able to determine this is a post-Maria picture, that this sapling was about this high, where the stem is kind of brown here, before Maria. But after Maria, it really had its day, and it's grown up a tremendous amount with this, this green stem indicating relatively recent growth. So this is another way in which a lot of trees take advantage of that light, start to grow up, eventually, if they're lucky, assume a role in the canopy, flower, fruit, and reproduce. Then a third major way is via uh, seedlings that appear from newly germinated seeds after the hurricane opens up the canopy and the soil gets hot. So here we have a guarumo uh, right at one of the points where we measure the canopy height, in fact, and it's growing up. There's a very fast-growing tree and so that plays a role also in, in recreating that, that forest, uh, the original come, returning to what, something like the pre-hurricane forest. Here's a grove of saplings coming in in the forest understory. So here's what happened after uh, Hugo, uh, looking at it in the same terms that I showed just for the pre and post Hugo uh, canopy profile. This is the same diagram I showed you before which was just before Hugo and I guess uh, two months afterwards. Uh, then this is again before Hugo in the open bars, uh, 20 months afterwards. And you can see it's starting to fill out. There was a lot of that, as I say, seedlings and growth in the understory here. But the canopy is starting to come back too. Here we are 40 months, so three years and four months later, it, uh, the understory is starting to diminish a little. And you're getting sort of almost a closed canopy at a somewhat lower level, but it's starting to look something more like it did before. And then uh, this, I forget, I think this was about uh, five or six years after the hurricane. You've got something, uh, again, with the black bars that's almost back, getting back to where it was before. So that's how the forest recovers. Uh, sprouting of the, of the damaged trees that have survived, growth of saplings that take advantage of that highlight, and then new plants in the sense that they germinate from seedlings and start to grow up. Also, you can ask, how does, that's how structure recovers. How does species composition, does the species composition change? Are the trees that were there before the hurricane different from the ones that were, are come afterward? Are the relative abundances the same? Are the ones that were common before, common afterward, and so on? So does it, does it really change the species composition? Well, our data from that Lukeo forest dynamics plot, where we uh, census trees from time to time, 
uh, showed us that, in fact, uh, there are only some very minor changes and probably ephemeral changes. After Hugo, the forest came back to what it was before, still resembled, resembled in terms of species composition, uh, the forest beforehand. Now, the way this works is we have here the, uh, the logarithm of the stem number of different species before Hurricane Hugo. So here's uh, the number of Andara enormous. That's its abundance before Hugo. And this is its abundance over here after Hugo. And it's for the same for each one of these dots, which represents a species. And what you see is that the ones that are less common are still uncommon. And the ones that were common before, before the hurricane, are still common afterwards. There are a few uh, exceptions. There are a couple of things that were reduced in number. And a couple of things like the uh, Cercropia, the Guarumo, I mentioned, that came back strongly. But in general, you have the same community structure in terms of the species that are present and their, their relative abundances. The ones being common, still common. Ones being rare, still rare. The species composition did not change all that much. The hurricane makes the far, damage of the forest, makes it look terrible. But at least after Hugo, the forest came back and the species composition didn't really change that much. But what I'm going to talk about today is the distinct possibility that this will not happen in the future, that we are going to see changes if we have an increasing number of really strong hurricanes. Um, so will we get this kind of recovery of structure that I mentioned, and will we get this stability of tree species composition? That's that's the question. A little bit about what hurricanes do to forests. This is a diagram uh, put together by H.T. Odom, who did a tremendous amount of work out at El Verde in the 1960s. And uh, one of the things that he pointed out was how different the three-dimensional structure of the forest at El Verde, which is a hurricane forest from time to time influenced by hurricanes, how different it is from forests that are not influenced by hurricanes, which are some of them at least these tall, uh, dramatic forests with great big trees, big emergent trees. And he noticed that this, this low uniform canopy, and he said that's because of hurricanes. Hurricanes come in and uh, produce this, this canopy either by just continually sort of pruning the trees so that they don't grow very tall, or maybe even selecting evolutionarily for trees that don't grow too big and sort of keep their heads low so they don't get knocked down. But one way or another, you've got a forest that's like this. That's what's produced by a hurricane. So uh, a change in the number of hurricanes, if, if, if the amount of number of frequency of hurricanes we have now does this, then some big change is going to have an impact as well. Um, so vertical structure is what we're talking about. Why do we care about that? Well, it does affect uh, the, the, the type of trees that are able to come in. It, it, it affects that light climate on the ground. And I was talking about how that affects growth of trees and germination of trees. Uh, it'll affect things like uh, epiphytes, which grow in trees and, and along their trunks and so on. If you have a forest that's shorter, there may be fewer uh, opportunities or niches for such things to take root, things like orchids and so on. It will affect uh, animals because you have a tat structure, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. He, uh, this forest is very different from the uh, habitat structure here. So a change in the vertical structure has consequences for biological diversity. Here's an example of what I'm talking about. There's a well-known pattern of, of between what is called foliage height diversity, which is sort of exemplified graphically in these two cartoons, and the number of bird species in forests. These are uh, data from uh, Scotland, actually, where they have uh, uh, plotted here this index foliage height diversity, which is a way of determining how complex this is by measuring various things. 
and the number of bird species. The more complex the forest, the more bird species. And this not just in Scotland, but has been shown around the world in different forests on different continents. So if you change this, if you change this, uh, you may affect uh, bird species diversity and a lot of other things like epiphyte diversity, all kinds of other animals, lizards, everything that finds a niche in that vertical profile of the forest. So once again, we have this situation now. This is the non-hurricane forest. This is what El Verde uh, looked like before Maria and probably will look like this in another 20 years if another Maria does not come along. But uh, if we start getting more really strong hurricanes, uh, we could go to a situation like this, where we have high, we had high foliage high diversity here, low here, and even lower. And the reason I think that may be true is because there are other hurricane forests in the world which are really scrubby, places that get hit by hurricanes a lot. So this is a distinct possibility. Remember, uh, at the time of Hugo, there hadn't been a really big hurricane in, in uh, 30 or 40 or 50 years or something. Just since 1989, we've now had three really big hurricanes. So the frequency has increased, which is what the climate modelers have predicted. So this is the possible new forest with, with perhaps reduced, reduced biological diversity of plants and animals. Um, what will be the impact on, on tree species? That's the impact on structure and a little bit about biodiversity. What will be the impact? I'm going to review here those regeneration modes I was talking about. You've got the sprouting of the damaged trees. You've got that accelerated growth of saplings that were already in the understory. And then you've got these seedlings coming up here seedlings coming up here that germinate in response to soil heating and high light uh, and, and start really capitalizing and growing up after a hurricane strikes. I'll give you one example. This is the Guarumo that I mentioned before, Cecropia shrubberiana. This tree was relatively uncommon at the time of Hugo compared to some other species. After Hurricane Hugo, it was just enormously abundant. There were thousands of these in our forest dynamics plot, uh, growing rapidly in high light like this. So I uh, was really intrigued by this and did a little research, uh, book research on Cecropia, and I came up with a kind of a model for how hurricanes at different, at different intervals and in frequency would affect the Cecropia population. And based on what I knew and could see from the literature, Cecropia would really thrive if there were more, more hurricanes. And I think I turned out to be wrong. I don't think that's going to happen. Instead, I think Cecropia may become less, less common. And I'll tell you why. The next hurricane after Hugo was Hurricane George. And uh, it was not as didn't do as much destruction as, uh, as Hugo did, but it opened up lots of canopy. It was still very bright and sunny out there. But by comparison with Hugo, hardly any Cecropia came up. And at first, I didn't know why until a friend of mine, Joanne Sharp, who studies ferns, told me why. She said, look at the understory. It's still covered with ferns and all kinds of other small plants that were thriving from the time after Hugo. And even though there's a lot of light coming in, it's not actually getting down to the soil the way it was after Hugo. So there were many fewer Cecropia. So my prediction, my prediction was wrong. And you can see why I think that with increased hurricanes, this, this archetypal pioneer tree that comes in after disturbance might be much less common. And of course, I'm not just, this is not just about Cecropia. The, 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 the dynamics of other species, which are now, uh, however, they've been linked to the hurricane dynamics and, and uh, disturbance, are likely to change as well. So we can't assume that we're going to get that stability of species composition that we thought we saw after Hugo.
Here's, what's, here's what may happen. This is a part of the forest now. Take this picture a few days ago. And this is what part of it looks like, this extremely dense layer, in this case, of some kind of grass and vines, behucos, and uh, dense herbs. There are no warumo in this picture. So I think that uh, looking at those uh, regeneration types, well, uh, at least for the time being, more strong hurricanes, it probably won't affect this re-sprouting response. It may not affect the accelerated growth of already established saplings, or maybe a little bit, because you're going to have a lot more vines and things crawling around, but might really inhibit the trees that need to come up from seeds. It's, and again, as I mentioned, it's not just about these trees. With the, with the understory being so drastically changed, by perhaps by repeated hurricanes, we may just get this dense brush down below, and that's really going to change things over the long term in terms of what trees come in. After all, this is, this is where the forest starts out. Every one of these trees, whether they're sprouting, or they're in this situation or this situation, did start out like this. So if you change that lower level, which I think you would if you had a lot more strong hurricanes, eventually it's going to affect the canopy, all the canopy trees. Yeah. Yes, yeah. That's that's what I think may happen, yeah. So what I was asking is if what you're saying is that the species that were living before the hurricane, um they're gonna they're gonna have seeds on the soil and the and that seed bank is not gonna regrow because there's some other species that are already in there and are gonna create shadows. So because mm -hmm. there's no sunlight exposure, they're gonna just gonna stay in the soil. And well, even if they germinate, up. these these cecropias require pretty high light right from the get-go. Let's see, where were we? They require a high light even when, right after they germinate. So, uh, and this is what I thought, think we saw after Hurricane George when I was expecting to see a repetition of the tremendous population burst of Cecropia. But it's not just Cecropia. So this is what parts of the forest look now. It's really patchy out there. It doesn't all look that, all, look all that scrubby. So uh, impact on species diversity. But there's some other things you have to think about, too. Okay, maybe the species that come from seed will decline and maybe there are other impacts on all that come from seed, seed immediately after a hurricane decline. There'll be some other impacts because all trees start from seed at some point. Uh, and then vines may suppress those, the other class. But there's another consideration too. These forests, that, some of these forests that are hit by uh, hurricanes very frequently and are low and dense, there are a lot more stems of trees per unit area. And all of the things being equal, if you just have more tree stems of whatever species in one place and, and compared to another place in the same area, you're going to have more species where there are more tree stems. So at that scale, diversity may be actually be uh, uh, higher with more hurricanes because you're going to have more stems in there. But at some other scale, uh, there may be fewer species at a larger scale. Impact on ecosystem services. I, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but I thought I'd put, put something in here. Uh, if you go from this forest to this forest, uh, ecosystem services are the, the goods and services and benefits that people get from, from natural ecosystems. If you go from this forest to this forest, which is what may happen, there's less, perhaps, water storing capacity in the forest and in its soil here, which means may mean less storage for water coming down the mountain and serving people's needs. There's also going to be a lot less carbon storage, uh, both in the living vegetation, despite maybe the denser stems, and in the soil underneath. So less, less carbon sequestration uh, impacts on 
on greenhouse gases. Um, so these are, these are my uh, predictions. Uh, and remember, the last time I made a prediction, I was wrong. But <laughs> these are my predictions. Shorter, denser forest. Re reduce species, species diversity of animals and epiphytes because of that simplified habitat structure. Uh, change in species composition and diversity of trees. It's not clear how that's going to work out. There's so much we, we don't know because uh, we haven't seen the conditions of the future. Probably redu maybe reduced water flow, reduced carbon storage. Now, uh, maybe because I have such a poor record of predicting things, I'm, I'm wrong about all this, and I hope I am wrong. Uh, so I thank you very much, and uh, just put up the acknowledgments here, and be, I guess I'll answer, the idea is to answer questions after Jess finishes as well. Okay. Okay, good afternoon. Um, so Nick talked about hurricanes. I'm going to talk about uh, the potential for increasing drought and, and talk in general about what impacts that might have on Puerto Rico, uh, but then switch back and talk about how that's going to impact the ecology of, of the El Junque forest. Um, but first, what I want to do is just give a little bit more background about what long-term ecological research is. Um, we have, we've been funded by the National Science Foundation since 1988 to study the long-term ecological research of El Junque. Um, we're a group of, the numbers change over time, but has averaged about 25 environmental scientists uh, of a range of disciplines um, working at the site. Um, we're, we're coming up on our 30th anniversary. Uh, we have a renewal proposal into the National Science Foundation now, which will continue our funding for another six years. So it'll be, a, if we get renewed, it'll be a big party. Um, and the collaborating institutions were, the, the, the project is managed by University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, um, in collaboration with, with the International Institute of Tropical Forestry. And then we have scientists now from the mainland institutes of, well, there's Turabo University as a collaborating institution on the island and then Cal Berkeley, Columbia, Connecticut, Florida International, Georgia, and New Hampshire are, are collaborators uh, on the mainland. Um, so why long-term ecological research? This graph shows you, um, it's very difficult to see, but it shows you the different time periods of uh, ecological phenomenon. Uh, this this um, um, text you can't see talks about different time periods of phenomenon from um, uh, global warming, uh, climate change, um, some tectonic events, and then tides and stuff at shorter intervals. And basically what it's saying was is at the time that this program was created that most ecology considered very short time intervals, up to two or three years. That was the average length of a National Science Foundation uh, proposal. And then you can study paleoecology by coring lakes and so forth, and that's called paleoecology. You could look deep into time, hundreds to thousands of years ago, but there was a clear gap uh, marked by this green here on periods of years to centuries um, that long-term ecological research could fill. And so they funded a series of sentinel sites um, to undertake these long-term measurements to give us this long-term perspective. Today, there are 28 sites, mostly in the mainland U.S., um, uh, coastal sites, prairie, um, forested sites on both coasts, um, and then also in Antarctica, as well as Alaska, there are a number of sites. And then we're one of two tropical sites. We're a terrestrial site uh, in, um, in Tahiti, uh, Morea, there's a, 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 a marine site that's funded. And these are, these are funded competitively. Um, there's two sites on here, one in Georgia and one in Colorado that have been defunded because they were, their research was deemed not to be acceptable. Uh, and there's a, there's a, they give you a chance to come back. We've gone through this process a couple of times. It really gets you focused when they threaten to cut off your money. So this is, this is not gravy train. This is not automatic money. 
uh, it's, it's, it's reviewed very carefully. And so um, hopefully we will carry on for the next six years with, without any problems. So I think of um, an LTR as two sets of three-legged stools. So there's an L, excuse me, there's an LTR program uh, which consists of long-term research as well as information management. We, we every all the data we collect um, by law or by by directive of the National Science Foundation must be placed on the internet after two years after it's collected. So the public pays for the collection of the data, uh, and we make it available to the public, whether they may know what to do with it or not. Uh, it's made available to the public, and then we have a fairly strong education and outreach program that involves local schools as well as uh, undergraduate programs. And then this long-term research by itself is a three-legged stool that consists of long-term monitoring. So we monitor, you'll see some of the long-term data. We monitor streams, we monitor forest productivity. Nick was showing some of the forest structure that we monitor. We have this Lukeo forest dynamics plot where we monitor closely the dynamics of the forest, but we study streams, forests, and soils. And then um, to, to kind of tease apart um, causality or mechanisms driving some of the changes we see, we do experiments and then we take the results of the long-term model experiments incorporated into models that then allow us to um, um, predict or, or, or forecast uh, future conditions. And I'm going to talk about the interplay between long-term mo monitoring and modeling a little bit in my talk. So that's LTR, it gives you context of why we're collecting these data. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how will, how, how will precipitation change in Puerto Rico by the end, and that should say end of the century. Um, and then I'm going to show you what happened. We had a fairly severe drought in 2015, actually 2014 to 2016. And I'm going to show you that, talk about that, talk about some definitions of drought, and then I'm going to return to the rainforest and talk about the implications of this for um, rainforest ecology. Um, so this is mean annual rainfall. It's distributed across the island of Puerto Rico. Um, most places get, um, this is actually done in inches because this is actually a, from a publication prepared for, for the general public. Um, but most places get between 30 and 60 inches of rain. We work in El Junque, which is one of the wettest spots on the earth. Uh, we get over 200 inches of rain, or, or three and a half meters, uh, across most of the mountains. So you have the easterly trade winds coming into the island, running into the, the first portion of elevation, or high topography, and this essentially, as those wet um, air rises, it tends to rain out, and so you tend to get a lot of rainfall where in the eastern part of the island as opposed to the other part of the island. <laughs> This, this slide shows a, a recent study done by a, a climate hub, USDA climate hub, that's located at IITF, that looks at, for different, I'm sorry, I keep pushing the wrong button, looks at different scenarios from kind of a pessimistic uh, business as usual scenario in terms of future um, carbon dioxide uh, levels in the atmosphere. This is comparing 1960 to 1990 versus the end of the century pessimistic versus optimistic scenarios in terms of how much greenhouse gases are going to be in the atmosphere, what's going to happen to precipitation across the island as well as temperature. So the precipitation, the, the redder colors are greater declines. Um, El Junque being the wettest part of the island um, has a lot the more to lose in terms of precipitation and you see that in fact they're predicting a 50 percent uh, reduction in precipitation over time depending on whether you take an optimistic or a pessimistic point of view. Similarly, we're predicting increases in temperature between four and eight degrees. Now we're talking Celsius, um, between four and eight degrees Celsius, again, depending on, on, the, um, on, on, on the projection. Um, so it's gonna get, uh, one way or another, it's gonna get a lot hotter and a lot drier. Um, these are some fairly detailed projections we're doing for El Junque, trying to look at, um, basically, there's a 
couple of ways that you can do these modeling. These, these global circulation models that all these are derived from are very coarse in terms of their spatial resolution. Uh, and one pixel in those models essentially takes up the entire island of Puerto Rico. And there's been several groups that have been going through the process of what they call downscaling, where you link regional climate models to the global circulation models to get a more fine scale understanding about how precipitation may change in the future. And our collaborator at the University of Georgia, Tom Moak, does this by dividing our weather into different weather types. In other words, low rain days like we're having now, light rain days, scattered, moderate, and widespread rain. And then he runs these climate models, again, with optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. Uh, here, the green is the pessimistic scenarios. The blue is the optimistic scenarios. Uh, compares different models and asks, what is the frequency of little days with little or no rain going to be uh, at the end of the century compared to now? And by mid-century, we get a lot more dry days and fewer days of light rain. Similarly, at the end of the century, many more days of no rain, fewer days of light rain, but a slight increase of, uh, of very rainy days. Um, and so this, this is very consistent with the models that we're going to have less rainfall in the future, but it's going to become much more variable. We're going to have a lot more dry days, and then we're going to have days, a lot more days with very heavy rain. And then, so what is the implications of this for stream flow? This is from a recent paper uh, out of IITF, out of, the, out of the Climate Hub. Again, looking at pessimistic versus optimistic scenarios, looking at the stream flow or, or withdrawals out of uh, Lago La Plata and Lago Luisa, the two main sources, two main reservoirs for San Juan. And you can see under both scenarios, uh, water withdrawals or stream flow decreases in all of them as drought becomes more frequent in the future. And in fact, they drop to the point where um, the withdrawals are going to exceed the amount of stream flow into the reservoirs uh, by um, 2025. Or, or 2050, uh, depending on the scenario involved. So um, in more increased frequency of drought means less water in the water system uh, and, and less water for humans to, cons to consume. So what happens to the ecology under these, under these projections? These are, um, this is proje the projected changes in life zones. So this is the current life zone map for Puerto Rico, um, most of, we've divided the world up into different kinds of rainforest, dry forest, moist forest, wet forest. It's basically the two, th the three different types. And uh, Puerto Rico, if there were no humans, would be dominated by moist forests. And then you'd have wet forests and rainforests in El Junque. And then of course, dry forests in, in, from Ponce to Guanaca along the southwest coast of the island. Whether you take an optimistic or pessimistic point of view, um, the moist life zone is going to disappear or become restricted to El Junque. M most of the island is going to be converted to dry forest, now tropical dry forest, not subtropical dry forest because it's much warmer. Uh, and what we call dry forest now is going to be converted into what they call thorn forest. And so um, well, tropical moist forest in this dark blue remains in, in some of the projections, but not to the extent that you see uh, subtropical moist forest now. So they're predicting <coughs> excuse me, large changes in the life zones. So what, what happens for El Junque? Well, we took advantage of our long-term monitoring. You know, part of a long-term ecological research program is being in the right place at the right time. We have by 2015, we had 25 years, 26 years of background information on how this system functioned, and then we had a very severe drought. And this is the 2015, you all remember the 2015 drought, you guys were all on rationing and so forth. It was a mess. Excuse me. <coughs> so um, this is the 2015 drought from the perspective of what the USDA calls their drought monitor. You can go on the web at any time and see what the status of the island is with respect to drought. Um, basically, the drought, well, this integrates three different ways of looking at drought. Uh, it actually stopped, or the, the rainfall ceased 
uh, in April, uh, and the drought built through through the summer, but became very severe by September and October, even though we had a couple of storms, a couple of tropical storms come through, uh, built up and finally started receding uh, through the latter part of, of the year. Um, so we took advantage of this. We decided we we're gonna treat this as a, a, it's kind of a joke, but a dry run for climate change uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, one of the things we learned is the, the whole world was going through a drought at this time, and this was linked to the El Nino uh, Southern Oscillation, uh, climate oscillation. That's what INSO means here. Um, in fact, what we discovered was is that it was large inputs of Sahara dust from, from Africa that were shutting down convection and causing um, causing the reduction in, in production of, of rainstorm clouds. So a very unique explanation um, because the general pattern is, is that INSO doesn't affect precipitation in Puerto Rico the way it does in many parts of the world. Uh, and so we happen to have a, a drought for different reasons at, at the same time. Um, the other interesting thing is, is that this drought coming in midsummer as it did mimicked what the models are saying, the climate models are saying is, is that drought is going to come as an increased midsummer drought. We typically have a drought in May, June. Uh, sometimes it appears, sometimes it doesn't, but, but um, um, which we sometimes call a beta, or you call beta neo in Spanish. Um, we were predicting that that's going to become more frequent. So the timing of the drought was it, not the cause, was similar to what the models were impacting. And so what I'm going to show you is for our site, you can think about Drought is coming in, in three different ways. One being a reduction of rainfall, which then leads to reduction of soil water, or what we call agricultural drought, and then eventually a reduction in streamfall. And then as the drought ceases, it works backwards. You get an increase in rainfall, which finally recharges soils, and once you recharge the soils, you recharge the, the stream flow. So these are also kind of three different levels of severity of drought. So at our field station in Alverde, which Nick showed you the location of, you can look at the, the 2015 drought in the context of the normal rainfall, which at our site gets up to a little over 3,000 millimeters or three meters of rainfall. Uh, in our, that year, uh, we got up to about 1,500 millimeters of rainfall, similar to a drought that occurred in 1994, and it was actually the 1994 drought that took, took, got our eye on the fact that you could have a drought in a rainforest, and it never occurred to us. Uh, before that time. And then um, this light blue line that you can barely see is the year 2010, which was one of the wettest years we've had. We had almost five meters of rainfall uh, at El Verde. So you can see the 2015 drought in the context of the, of the average and the extremes. And the departure, again, occurred in April. You started seeing um, in April and May a departure from the normal seasonal rainfall uh, pattern. Um, this is a series of data on soil moisture measured along a topographic gradient from in red valley bottom. So there's a, there's a consistent topography in, 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 in our side of the mountain and the valleys tend to remain moist and the ridges here in the blue and purple tend to dry out. And what you can see is, is that it dried out fairly quickly. This is, you can't see the numbers here, but you have to trust me, this is in April, May when, when the, the rain ceased, it dried out very severely uh, and, and, and bottomed out about this time. And I'm going to show you some, a phenomenon that happened as a result of this uh, in just a second. And then hydrologically, again, kind of difficult to see, but, but in, in the dark line here, this is 25 years of stream flow data from the Mamaeus River, another major river that drains El Junque. And here you can see in the black line, the, the long-term average, or well, this is seasonal. So this is 25 years average stream flow, which is fairly consistent through the year, a little bit lower at this time of year when it's a little bit drier. Uh, and then the two drought years, the, the two drought years, um, 2015 in yellow and 1994 in red, and you can see it dried out, the stream flow is very reduced, and then it's very slow to recover, even though it started raining later in the year. Uh, and then again, 2010 is a, is a wet year for comparison. So those are the three different components of the drought. <coughs> uh, and you can see 
I'm just here making the point that the the reason that the drought took a long time to cease in this drought monitor, this drought monitor that USDA publishes on its website incorporates all three of those factors. But because stream flow was so slow to recover, it shows the drought um, lingering well into the fall, even though the rains had returned. Okay, so what happened in terms of long-term monitoring of forest function? One of the things we measure, here's a little basket uh, out in the forest. Um, sometimes we actually use laundry baskets with screen in them. Sometimes we're a little bit more sophisticated and make PVC frames. But we go out every two weeks and we collect all the litter that's fallen into the basket. And we do that, one, because it's a measure of forest productivity. If a forest is growing fast, it turns over the leaves fast and the leaves fall fast. So it's a measure for us of productivity. It has its own seasonality. This is a 12-year record for one of our experiments. We get a turnover in the canopy in the fall uh, because that's when a number of the trees actually replace their leaves. They drop their leaves and replace it with new ones. Sometimes you get peaks in, in the fall. That's because of storms coming through and knocking the leaves off the trees. And that's, in 2015, that's what this is. This is Tropical Storm Erica, which came through, which was compared to what we've been seeing lately, uh, a pretty minor storm. But nonetheless, it, you do see the impact in the forest. One of the things we noticed was, is we first noticed that the drought was going on when we had a huge amount of litter fall in these litter fall baskets. We had to send out an extra crew to collect it all up. It was a huge amount. And that's because that was just at the time when the soil moisture bottomed out. And we're still struggling to know what this means, whether this is an adaptive response, whether the forest as evolutionarily adapted to respond to drought this way, or if it was just kind of like, oh my God, it's really dry. I need to drop all my leaves and reduce my demand on soil moisture. Um, so we don't know if it's just a, it's just a, 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 an evolved response or just plants getting dried out and dropping their leaves just as, as they do when you forget to water them at home. Um, but nonetheless, um, and all of this litter fall, this opens up light in the canopy uh, and this all ends up in the streams and impacts the stream ecology. And in fact, one of the things we study uh, in detail is the long-term study the, these upland streams. These upland streams have interesting ecology. Normally, they're, they're, they're under a closed canopy. They're not now, uh, after the hurricane. They're normally under a closed canopy, and those leaves that fall into the, into the streams, this is why we measure it, are actually food for the organisms that live there. There is a series of shrimp and um, uh, insects that feed on these things. They actually break down the leaves uh, and solely process it. But they also like to eat algae, and they preferably eat algae, single-celled algae, in the stream water that can become abundant when you open up the canopy uh, and allow light to actually strike the floor. And to them, it's like peanut butter. So you can think of the leaves as crackers and the algae is peanut butter, and they would rather be eating peanut butter than, than leaves, but uh, than crackers, but they'll take the crackers if that's all there is. And so this is a, on the right-hand side, is a very simplified trophic food web. This is the way we think about material and energy flowing through the organisms that are in the, that are in the stream. There's algae that are photosynthetic, the photosynthetic, photosynthetic that bring energy into the system directly. There's detritus or leaves that fall into the stream, and both insects and shrimp feed on that. One of the things we noticed was in the drought was is that while there was little impact on shrimp abundance, there was a huge increase in the number of insects that we found in the streams, not normally present. These are our long-term data. These numbers jump up during the drought, and at the same time, I'm not showing you this, but at the same time, the amount of algae decreases, and that's because the insects are consuming the algae. So you have a, a big shift in the trophic structure of the stream as a result of drought. It's not, un, it's not unusual for a freshwater aquatic system to show, show these shift in trophic systems, but it is interesting to show it in this context. And then in terms of trees, <coughs> some of the ecology that Nick was talking about, we can actually quantify with things like the wood density of trees and the size of the leaves they produce. <clears throat> and so the species Cecropia he was talking about, or Yagrumo, um, has very low wood density compared to other species and very large leaves compared to other species. And these tend to do not well. This is, this is the drought effect on growth. So 
species with low wood density, these fast growing species that come in after hurricanes, do, uh, have much slower growth compared to other species during a drought. And, as, and same as those species with very large leaves that are these fast growing species also do fairly poorly. And so this is kind of the double whammy if you start putting drought on top of hurricanes, which is what we're going to see is the species that become abundant, if they become abundant after hurricanes, Nick is predicting they may not, but if they become abundant, these are the species that are partic particularly susceptible to drought. And so um, th there's a potential double, double whammy coming if we start having more frequent droughts as, is, as we predict. Um, using this information and not thinking yet about the impact of hurricanes, um, we've developed a model which is called the ecosystem demography model, which is just basically takes the physiology of all these species, incorporates the impacts of drought, and we did a projection where we let, we slowly dried out the system and let the temperature rise uh, going to the end of the century as is predicted, and then we looked at net ecosystem productivity. Forest growth, is, the, is forest growth positive, is it negative? And what you see is, is that net ecosystem productivity declines over time, and this model projects that by 2036, the forest will simply stop growing as a result of the increased frequency of droughts, like we saw in 2015. Um, and again, this is without the impact of hurricanes. We're running hurricane simulations, and then eventually we'll combine the two. And then another thing we're doing, and, I'm, and I'll just touch on this briefly, is I've been talking to you about middle elevation forests, which we call Tabanuco Forest, the forest we have around our field station in El Verde. As you go up the mountains, as you drive up 191 into El Junque, you go through three, at least three, well, you go through three other forest types. Um, and one of those, there's a parking area up there that are recreation area called Palo Colorado, and that's because at intermediate elevations, you get something that's called Colorado Forest that's dominated by Palo Colorado. And then at the very tops of the forest, on top of Mount Britain, on top of El Junque Peak, you have dwarf forests or elfin forests um, that are basically maintained by the clouds that pass over the forest. And, and these, these are areas of very heavy rainfall, but lots of cloud inputs and lots of wind. And then at various elevations, you have palm forests. There's a species called Sierra palm uh, that's, that occurs everywhere. But it, in, in certain areas, it occurs in almost pure stands. These tend to be the steepest areas, um, with um, in the steepest areas with a with a, a lot of drainage. Um, and what we've done is um, working from El Verde at the bottom of this transect, going up to the to the top of El Junque. We've created a transect where we're. This is just showing you the level of detail which we're <coughs> measuring the responses not only of the forest, but we list here a series of organisms. We're looking at frogs, lizards. Um, there's a large co community of gastropods or land snails uh, that we study. And last summer, we, we measured everything up and down this elevational transect. We're now re-measuring, our plan was to re-measure it every six years, but of course, with the advent of Hurricane Maria, we're gonna look at the hurricane impacts on that. But my point here is, is that we have this detailed study plan for looking at the changes along the elevational gradient as these changes in precipitation and hurricane frequency uh, evolve over time. And at that point, I will stop and catch my breath and take some questions from you all. We can just stand here. <laughs> Measurement on wind and precipitation measurement. Uh, do you do you have uh, uh, instruments measuring wind speed at El Verde and several points or one point? And we have there are weather stations at El Verde, um, and fortunately our tower remained standing during the storm. We had to replace the equipment. We were able to do that in a month or six weeks. I can't remember. So we're continuing to measure wind and, and all of those things: you, rainfall, wind, temperature, and um, the instruments radiation. held up. Yeah, the instruments held up, but they didn't hold up in, in in some other places. Sometimes they don't hold up. Yeah. Of course, we lost our our radar station. 
But we also have weather stations elsewhere in the eastern part of the rainforest, areas called Sabana and Bisley, mm -hmm. and there's also one that was maintained uh, that was that we lost in the storm uh, at Pico del Este, up in the rainforest next to the. How rain high did the how high did the wind go? The speed. You remember? I. I don't haven't looked at our data um, because we lost it. I'm not oh. sure what the wind wind levels were before we lost it. I, I haven't checked that. Okay, uh, it's a. Uh, if if you know or afterwards you can tell me. But I'm I'm trying to get a sense of where actually was wind speed measured when Maria, and uh, where were the stations? Because I'm not clear. It uh, and uh, how accurate were those instruments? Have they been calibrated recently? And suppose you hear all kinds of measurements uh, about the wind speed uh, from Maria that I've been wondering about. But, uh, there are some professors in, in, in our department. There's a professor in our department, Professor uh, Olga Mayor, which is working with uh, some weather stations in the forest, but she have um, in an, an, where was it? In, I don't know if it was in El Junque Peak or it was a uh, Pico del Este. Pico del Este, yeah. They had they had a weather station in Pico del Este in, in the Junque, and it was completely gone during the hurricane. So probably, yeah, probably uh, most of the data that was in in that process it's gone. Maybe they don't have that data, or maybe it's, it was monitored before it shut it down. So I know the professor, and they they haven't even um, turned on again the the station because it's completely gone. Yeah. Yeah, Juan. I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get wind speeds when the when the instrument was destroyed, not the peak wind speeds. But but I'm I'm sure they survived in some places like San Juan uh, at, at the airport. Uh, but I don't think any of ours survived. They didn't survive either. In the Department of Natural Resources, they also have one, and then it didn't survive either. I could imagine. High in the mountains, high. Yeah, I could thing. imagine, yeah. given the strength of the storm. Yeah. But not, not sustained. No, no, peak gust, gust winds, peak winds. Yeah. Norman. This is, <clears throat> this is just for clarification, because maybe I'm making a connection that's not there, but. Uh, First, you mentioned the change of habitat type, uh, the shifting of the type of forest from uh, wet or moist forest to much drier forest. And then you also mentioned the 2036 as the time when the forest is, in the model is projected to just stop growing. Are those two related and linked? In other words, in 2036, because the forest stops growing, will that be kind of a turnover time for more conversion to another type of forest, or is that a, a link that's... Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it kind of goes to the core of what we're trying to do. So the change in life zones is, is basically projecting... There's a current relationship between variation in rainfall and temperature across the island and an association of vegetation with that. And, and that exercise was just simply saying, if the vegetation follows the changes in precipitation and temperature, what will it become? There's no, there's no, there's no trees growing, there's no, it's just saying, if we take what's the relationship today and move everything around, what would it look like without any mechanism in fly? The model exercise that I talked to you about just simply says of the species that are there and their known physiolo physiological response to drought and temperature, how fast are they going to grow when as conditions change? Uh, and it doesn't really incorporate the idea of mortality or turnover in community dynamics. So it takes things one step further. It says the trees that are growing now, there now, how will they, as a group, how will they respond to these changes in precipitation and temperature? What, you're, what we really want to ask is, how are those changes going to come about? What does it really mean? And if the forest stops growing, 
does it just stop growing and stay there or do things start dying out and then just things start replacing it and what starts to replace it do you have species invading from lower and are those species exotics or native species so there there's a whole bunch of dynamics that we can't project based on our current knowledge uh, of the ecology and that's really the question we want to be answering and we can't we can't quite get there yet so that's an excellent question So it, the question is either both of you. Um, so with all these predictions in terms of drought and you know vegetation change, what do you think will be the, the main and big impact in ecosystem services for the people um, I don't know, 30, 40 years? In what things do you think we need to focus and be concerned about how the forest is changed so our needs and you know biological needs for the people and you know diversity in other species? I, for me, from my perspective, it's rainfall, and so I didn't talk about this, but uh, I, well, I talked about it in terms of what, what Lago, uh, what the two lakes that serve uh, San Juan do, but um, about half of our stream flow that flows out of El Junque ends up in the public water supply, uh, and, it, and it, it's a lot of the rain, a lot of the water that lands on that forest is a public water supply, and it's not going to be there in the future. So I think the, the, the sort of droughts and, and, and uh, rationing that we've seen in 94 and again in 2015 are going to become very common. And I think we're going to have to think more carefully about how we manage our water. And one, one way to think about it is, if, is, to, is to look at the Virgin Islands, which are, are low islands that don't intercept a lot of rainfall, and you're expected to provide your own water there by building cisterns. And I think an individual-based cistern system is something that we're going to have to be thinking about for individual homeowners uh, as we go in the future. Because I don't, I don't think the public water supply systems are going to be able to do it without damaging uh, the ecosystem. You can, you can drain. We do this sometimes. We completely drain all the water out of those streams. Um, and I didn't talk about this, but there are migrating organisms. So all those shrimp have to go down to the estuaries. Um, to hatch, or they hatch, go down to the estuaries, and then they march back up, and the fish as well. There's all kinds of organisms that are migrating up and down those streams, uh, and you can't simply just completely drain them uh, of all the water. Sure, yeah, there are a couple of other things just to add. The, the drought, uh, as Jess said, it's not simply that there's less water, but the water may come more intermittently with long droughts, and then maybe a heck of a lot of rain that uh, that may result in, in a different chemistry of the water because of its interaction with the soil. So the water quality may change as well, it may change negatively. And then the other thing is that less, less water, yes, but if the forest becomes a uh, lot shorter and so on, that may ch change also just the, uh, you know, the the amount of water that's retained in the forest for gradual flow down the hill. So the, the supply would become uh, less, more intermittent, and of a different water quality, perhaps. Thank you. And I have another quick question. Is, do you think there's something that we can, we can do to you know, slow down this process? Because I think it's, it's, this is chaotic. Like, this is catastrophic. Yeah. Uh, what do you think we can do to slow down one, at least one of those processes? <laughs> Planting trees. <laughs> well, so, so in the projections that I was showing, uh, th those are based on various scenarios developed by the International Pan Panel on Climate Change, and there are some optimistic scenarios that simply involve us in, involve us very quickly reducing our gas, greenhouse gas production to zero, and really, ultimately, that's the only way you can control this. We can mitigate it in ways like I talked about, um, but you can't really change it until as a global community we decide to act on the fact that, that these greenhouse gases are real and they have real impacts, not on just ecology, uh, but on human welfare. Uh, 
the, the, oh, you mean the, you're the talking current, about the hurricane? The next hurricane season? Uh, it's yeah. going to be average, but um, the, the interesting thing about the 2017 hurricane season was so the, the global models don't actually predict an in, increase in hurricane frequency per se. Mm -hmm. but what they do in, predict is an increase of intense hur hurricanes mm -hmm. like Maria, like Irma, like Harvey. And the reason why is, is, is there's two things going on <clears throat> in the models. One is, is that, well, we all know this, the energy for hurricanes comes from warm oceans, and the oceans have become warmer. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nuance is, is that global warming also produces higher shear, which are these high-level winds that they will sometimes talk about in the, in the hurricane reports that will tear storms apart before they ever form. That's also supposed to increase in global warming. What we happened in 2017 is you had a, a t time period where there was no shear and you had very warm oceans. I mean, the, the oceans to the east of us are the warmer they'd ever recorded. They're usually deep Atlantic Ocean. They're not very warm. They were very warm as was the Gulf. And so you had the perfect conditions mm -hmm. for hurricane formation. And so you see these things. I mean, watching Harvey, you know, came by here as a tropical storm went across the Yucatan and headed up to Texas, hit the Gulf of Mexico, and went from a tropical storm to a Category 5 storm mm -hmm. in two days. That's the sort of scenario that they're talking about. So what we saw in 2017 was very consistent with, doesn't prove, but it's consistent with the models, what the models are projecting. I was going to, I think it was Nick that mentioned that in, in parts of the world that get hit by stronger hurricanes, more frequent than Puerto Rico, the, the shape of the forest, uh, you, you, you've been looking at the shape of the forest, yeah. and that that could happen. In, what what are what are the areas that you're looking uh, at? Well, in uh, South Asia, uh, Queensland, in Australia, uh, Taiwan, uh, the northern part of Taiwan, sure. and, uh, and the Philippines. yeah, well, yeah. There's there's other structures where they're sometimes they're really isolated big trees, but the forest itself is below is kind of scrubby. They're, they're actually, uh, if you go to different forests that are affected by hurricanes, you find a lot of variation of what they look like. But there are some that just get just get very low and dense and, and, uh, and scrubby. And there's some forests like that, in the, in the, I think, in the Lesser Antilles also. I think we lose sight that we don't have the largest or the strongest number of hurricanes in the world. That usually happens in the Pacific. In the, yeah, in yeah the, exactly. In the yeah, yeah. We usually think of the Atlantic hurricanes only, and mm -hmm. it's uh, more and stronger over there. Yeah. So, anyone? Hey, hey uh, thank you both for great presentations. And uh, this question's uh, particularly to Nick. I really like the uh, continuing the last question, that far structure part. That was really interesting. But thinking about it in terms of ecosystem services, uh, how will there's how will transpiration differ among those forest types? Like the, the, the current uh, water budget, transpir transpiration is the number one water loss. So I would think with like a change in biomass of the forest, we that could really affect the water budget through uh, transpiration. Yeah, for sure. I assume that in the long run, uh, drought and the dwarfing and the, the drought will select for, and the dwarfing of trees will select for smaller trees, maybe with smaller leaves, less leaf area, and that are more resistant to transpiration. Probably, you know, if you go to Guanaca, you've got trees that are more resistant to transpiration. So I think reduce transpiration. Both things they would do that. I imagine transpiration is pretty free at El Junque now. You know, we got 3,000, 4,000 millimeters of rain. Why worry about the water, your transpiration stream. <laughs> okay, well, great. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Rocco, Dr. Zimmerman, for uh, some very stimulating presentations. And uh, hope you'll be back in, so in social sciences soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.